Good afternoon. <laughs> Weren't those kids amazing? <laughs> oh my gosh. And it's so, it's so amazing to be looking at them, watching them, and I know this one, and I know, well, I mean, I don't know if I know them, but I know their parents. And what's scary is that I remember their parents being that small. <laughs> so, gosh, you guys, today, if you think about it, as we gather together, and, and we'll get into the word here in a moment, but uh, this is the 32nd year that we've been doing the Palm Sunday service. Started as a home Bible study, right? 32 years. And um, it's just amazing to me because we'll see why it's something that we need to be careful how we handle. Because you know how Christmas can be a routine, right? Uh, Fourth of July can be a routine and all that kind of stuff. Easter can be a routine, Palm Sunday. We need to be careful that we don't let that happen. Because the magnitude of what it all means and what it accomplished. And when those, when those kids were talking about I had no idea that they were going to be talking about actually Daniel's prophecy. Those kids, when they remember they were talking about the seven weeks and the 62 weeks? I got to tell you, most seminaries are graduating students with doctorate degrees in theology who would not have had an idea what they were talking about. And that's Daniel chapter 9. And I was impressed. That was great stuff. You guys, real quick announcements, um, kind of a recap to some of them, but this is what I have. And uh, that is the door hangers. I think we're all out. Is it true? We are out. There's a few left. What does, Anna, what does a few mean? Uh, several hundred. Several hundred left. So here's what the deal is. We, uh, we ask you to grab the several hundred that are left. And um, where your house is, go either five or ten directions to the left or five or ten homes to the right. And just hang them on the door of the house. You can all do that. We made this so that everyone can do it. Nobody can sit this out. Here's why. It's so simple. It not only invites them, but you can write if you want to. Depends on your neighbors, I guess. It says uh, that we've invited you. We, you know, the, the Johnson family or whoever family, we've invited you. And yet all the information is here. You don't have to put your name on there. But they can do the QR code. And let's, let's look at it this way. Every one of you can walk and hang this on a door. Getting the QR code out there, they may never come to church, but you will be giving them the way to go and get the gospel. And this is the least that we can do. And it's made so simple. So please, whatever few hundred are left, get those out there. And uh, that'd be it. We're not going to hand out any more as we're right in the resurrection season. So um, that's that. And then also this, we want to make sure that you guys know, and I need to explain this, April 19th is what's being called Lobby Day. I don't like the word Lobby Day. I, I would call the 19th Fight Day. <laughs> fight Day. And what do I mean by Fight Day? Fight Day by praying. Fight Day by showing up. Fight Day by caring. This is the end of the road, ladies and gentlemen. I mean that. It's not hyperbole. On Tuesday, April 19th, I'm asking you to join me at the state capitol as we speak and make our biblical worldview known. And uh, we're delighted. So there's over 700 people from this church that's already committed to going. Here's what I need to explain to you about. When you go to real, realimpact.us, it's going to say that it's full. It's going to say that it's full. Don't worry about that because uh, we're working on another venue to help us handle that. Just go. Show up. We'll be there. And um, from the gathering point that the information is there given at that site, then we'll make our way over to the Capitol. And uh, this is a big deal. If it passes, you know, it passed this week through the Judiciary Committee, which is literally sick that the Judiciary Committee uh, down, down party vote uh, two Republicans voted against it all Democrats voted for it that that is the, the infanticide bill would move forward now it goes to the health committee and that's where um, the people who claim to know something about health will vote on should we murder a baby uh, even days 
maybe a week, maybe more after it's born. It, it's, the, it's the mother's call. She may have the baby and choose not to have the baby. Now, what I'm telling you is gospel truth, which is why I've been interviewed New York Times, Washington Post, Washington Times, Newsmax, this week, media constantly on this, because what's happened, so much heat has already gone up to Sacramento that the author, Democrat from Oakland, Buffy Wicks, has amended the bill. Don't believe it for one moment. Alliance Defending Freedom, the nation's largest uh, uh, constitutional uh, group of attorneys for our Judeo-Christian worldview, ADF, uh, they looked at it and they said this is absolutely a stunt, what she has claimed to be an amendment. She's trying to get you off her back, but we're not going to be happy until she's out of office. Her... (laughs) Absolutely appalling. I just find it... Profound that somebody who's alive would make a determination about those who have not yet experienced life. You know what that is? That's pretending you're God. And it's also murder. In my opinion, because she authored AB 2223, look, God's going to deal with it on the day of judgment. But because this is made so public, if one child is murdered outside the womb because of this bill, I believe that those who voted for it should be held for premeditated murder. It's hard to believe. And I know that some of you have encouraged me by saying, that's why I'm moving. I'm getting out of here. Well, go ahead. Just know this. Maryland is already now looking at this to bring into their state. And after Maryland, don't expect, uh, don't expect Oregon and Washington state to miss out on this opportunity. Don't expect one of the Carolinas to miss out on the opportunity. What about Wisconsin? What do you think is going to happen in some of these other uh, states? This is absolutely, if, we, if, if this goes through, I personally believe, this is just my opinion. I'm not a prophet. God didn't show me something. But I know the Bible. And if this passes, then there's no place to hide in this country. If you know your Bible, there'll be nowhere to go. There'll be nowhere to flee. Uh, Maybe Costa Rica, which is, I got my eyes on Costa Rica. (laughs) Because it's, it's, this is the hand of God. If this passes, it's the hand of God's judgment upon this land. He will have given, he will have given this nation what it has wanted. And you might say, I don't want that. Well, if you don't speak up against it, then you want it. Silence is a confession of cooperation. We've got to let our voice be heard. It's the only thing that we have left. And so I understand that there's 49 other states, but what happens here doesn't stay here. It will end up in your state that you're moving to or the state that you're viewing us from. So everybody needs to fight this and stand strong against this. Um... It's a hill for me to die on. This is where, this is for me, this is, I can let other things go. But as a survivor of an abortion, this is where I, I die on this hill. Uh, if I can't stand for the defense of a born child, uh, then I don't know. So I don't even feel like mentioning, anybody new for the first time? Where? Yvette? Anyone? Anyone new? I'm trying to give something away. Here, can you do this, Jeff? Okay, watch your eyes. Did you sign the waiver, everybody? Yes! Good job. Jeff Mannion on the catch? Good job. Father, we pray that today, this day, is an amazing day. We already heard from our kids' choir how amazing it is. We could actually go home. They said it perfectly fine. And Lord, I pray that today we would look at this very, very well-known portion of scripture, this very, very every year, for us anyway, 32 years, teach on it. But Father, we pray today, and we know you will, infuse into our hearts and our minds and our lives fresh manna, 
from above. And Father, may we see you work in our lives. And may this week, starting today, all of these next seven days, and then coming out on Monday to the eighth day, we pray, God, that you'd make us a people full of the Holy Spirit, baptized in your power, and God, that we would stand against the tide of darkness by proclaiming the everlasting gospel, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for all sins, and he rose again from the dead. And for all those who would choose to put their trust in him, he would forgive them of their sins and give them eternal life. So Lord, we pray now, we ask in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, we're looking at a theme all this week, starting today, titled, Suddenly. Suddenly. And that's kind of a, it's kind of a play on words in some part, but it's also in some ways a, a word that defines what happened. Nearly 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, suddenly, the Bible says, the Lord shall come to his temple. And we see that happening this week in history. Suddenly, minds will be changed on Palm Sunday, 2,000 years ago, that we celebrate today. Suddenly, the gears are set in motion that would go against Jesus to, in their minds, get him arrested and get him killed. They think that they're working out their own plan. <laughs> but suddenly they'll discover that God had a perfect plan that they were actually bringing about even though they disagreed. They violated scripture, many did, to see to it that they stopped this Galilean from preaching. And their passion to destroy turned out to be exactly what God had engineered in the plan of redemptive history. Quite amazing. Before we get into our con congregational reading, I uh, want to remind you that in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 39, the Bible says, When you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. And on the first day, there shall be a Sabbath rest. And on the eighth day, that's the new day, the new day of beginning. That would be uh, the eighth day, obviously. When the seven are completed, you would have another Sabbath rest. Verse 40, and you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees and the branches of palm trees and the limbs of leafy trees and willows of the brook. And here it is. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. And now imagine, put on sandals. You're wearing uh, your robes and you've got your family with you. And you've come, you've come as far as North Africa on your Passover uh, celebration. For some of you, you have been traveling for nearly six weeks of time to get to Jerusalem. Historians tell us, Joseph, Flavius Josephus for one, uh, the annals of Roman history for the other, that there's somewhere between 2.5 and 2.8 million visitors in Jerusalem on this week in history. It's massive. Jerusalem's not that big, so where are the people staying? In a beautiful setting. They, they had little like lean-to huts and tents that they had established. And all over the rolling hills, if you've been with us to Jerusalem, the area of Bethany, Bethphage, and Bethlehem, there's all of these rolling hills, and it would have been dotted with color. Just imagine for a moment. Let your mind imagine that with all of these millions plus people there, uh, they're there to celebrate and worship the Lord. And so at night, there are campfires burning. And the temple is illuminated with the grand menorahs of the temple. Massive menorahs burning in the courtyard. Uh, and all of this glory is taking place. And while all the sacrificial lambs are being prepared... Some 283,000 lambs will die this week, 2,000 years ago in sacrifice. There's one lamb that is scheduled to die, but nobody knows that yet. God's word, though, has, had revealed it. Jesus had been telling the disciples. And this account, by the way, church, if you'd like to write it down, it's found in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 10. It's found in Mark 11, verses 1 through 11. We'll read it in a moment. Thirdly, it's found in Luke's Gospel 19, verses 28 to 44. 
And lastly, number four, it's found in John's gospel, chapter 12, verses 12 to 19. Now watch this. Almost as it were in quadraphonic sound, the report is coming in today in our Bible. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Few events are recorded in all four gospels. But this is special. Let's do a little test. How many of you remember, go ahead in a minute, be honest, you're in church. How many of you remember overhead projectors? Okay, there's old people in every service all, all day today. Do they even use them anymore? No, come on. Overhead projectors were amazing. If you remember now, for the, the younger people, you're going to miss out. But there was this, obviously, this flat uh, illuminated uh, table, and it had a reflector that put whatever you put on that table onto the wall, and you took, I think it was called vellum, remember the transparencies? And you would write something down, so Matthew, Matthew would write this down, and he'd set it down, and you'd see it on the wall, and you'd read Matthew, and you'd say, wow, that's amazing. Thank you, Matthew, for telling me that. The Gospel of Matthew, this is the, this is the account of Palm Sunday from Matthew's perspective. He was eyewitness. He was there. And he wrote it down. And then Mark's gospel. Now Mark was a young man, but Mark's gospel is known as Peter's gospel. Did you know that? Peter is actually the one that Mark interviewed to produce Mark's gospel. Interesting. And you get, now watch this, a second sheet of vellum put on top of the other one. So what do you know about overhead projectors, all five of us, you know that it's becoming more clear. With every layer of vellum projected, what story you're announcing becomes more clear. And then Luke comes along, and Luke might tell you this about it, and he even adds color to it. And now you've got the third layer, and it's taking on tremendous uh, sinew and muscle uh, and flesh to the event. And then John comes along, and it's John that finishes it off. He's the one who tells you that it's not only Jesus dying on the cross, but he's the great I am. That the eternal God is the one who's veiled in human flesh. And he's the one that is on the cross. He's the one that is going into Palm Sunday, the week ahead, today in history. And when you see it all from four different angles, you've got an undeniable presentation. And when I say undeniable, you heard those kids a moment ago. I was so impressed. They were, they were quoting and paraphrasing out of Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. And they were lifting what was happening with Nehemiah under King Artaxerxes in the book of Nehemiah. Now listen, don't get lost, stay tuned. Thousands of years ago, nearly 3,000 years ago, you've got God speaking to the prophet Daniel, listen, announcing, because Daniel came out after Nehemiah. Daniel knew about Nehemiah. He knew about that event. He knew about King Artaxerxes. What's the big deal? King Artaxerxes saw Nehemiah walk into his courtroom one day and into his presence. You're, in the Middle East, you are not allowed to walk into the presence of the king or queen sad. You had to be delighted <laughs> even if it was fake, to be there. Guess what Nehemiah did? Remember, he's a Jew in captivity, but he's highly trusted. Nehemiah walks in, and his mug is dragging on the ground. And King Artaxerxes says, what gives? What, what, what's, what's with this? And he said, <laughs> Nehemiah says, how can I be happy? You can just see him. How can I be happy? <laughs> you, you're sitting here on your throne, big whoop de doo My people, we're in captivity, but the worst of it, is my city, Jerusalem. The gates are burned with fire and the streets are broken down. I cannot be happy. King Artaxerxes, a Gentile, says, you know what, I'll have none of this. He could have said, off with your head. Or he did what he did. He said, Nehemiah, I will see to it. I will give you documents of authenticity. I will give you a passport with a blank check. And I want you to get back to Jerusalem and you get back there and you fix whatever's bumming you out. And when you're all done, then you come back to me. Isn't that sweet? What a witness he must have had, right? Nehemiah went. And you can read the book of Nehemiah. You say, who cares, Jack? You care because that edict went out from the king on 
March 14th, 445 BC. Artaxerxes gave that order. Nehemiah, go with my funding. Go with my permission. Daniel said, when you see the commandment to go forth and restore and rebuild in Jerusalem until the coming of the Messiah, the prince, remember what they said? There'll be seven sevens and 62 sevens. Those sevens are equated in years. It was 400, hello, are you listening? It was 483 years from Nehemiah's edict to go forth on, May 4, on March 14th, 445 BC, uh, 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 483 years from that day on a Babylonian calendar. Your Bible is based on a 360-day calendar, not 365. It takes you out to April 6th, 32 AD. It happens to be a Sunday. It happens to be 173,880 days from the commandment to go out from Nehemiah. What's the big deal? On that very day, Jesus enters this day in history. On the very day. (laughs) You know why I say that? Because those of you who say you don't believe in God because there's not enough evidence, you should look at it sometime. I believe from just this prophecy alone, I could say to anybody with authority, there's proof for the existence of God that is undeniable. See, today people tell us, and they've been saying it for a long time, and by the way, it was created by those who don't want to believe. You can't prove the existence of God. You know who invented that? People who don't believe. They don't want to believe. But you can prove the existence of God. When God says, look me up, 173,880 days from March 14th, 445 BC, and it will bring you to my arrival on April 6th, 32 AD. Oh, not not in Canada, not, not in Beverly Hills, but in Jerusalem. That that's exactly what happened. And who says so? The Roman government says so. Flavius Josephus, the unbelieving Jew who turned coat and worked for the Romans says so. Those who hated Jesus said so. The Arco volume of Constantinople says so. There is not only biblical evidence, but there is secular evidence that this day happened. The challenge is to you. Do you believe it? Because this week enters a tremendous week of great, incredible meaning and purpose. So church, let's stand and read our scriptures together if you would. Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. Mark 11, 1. I'll begin in verse 1 if you'll read verse 2. Mark chapter 11, verse 1. It says, now when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples... Did you guys, have you guys eaten lunch? (laughs) Raise your hand if you've eaten lunch. You're not going to admit it? You're, okay. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord, that is the Father, has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. But some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing loosening the colt? Verse 7. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. Verse 9, then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Wow. Verse 11, we'll end here. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So he went and looked around at all, the th- or all things. As the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Lord, we pray that you would illuminate our understanding to this precious moment in time. And Lord, help us to understand the magnitude that its meaning fully is not yet done. You're coming back. 
and how this relates determines everything for us. Lord, may our time here now not be wasted on anyone. We ask for your touch in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. It's quite shocking. In fact, if you are a student of Bible prophecy, you might want to make note of this. It helps you understand the scriptures. A lot of people get in debates about what do these uh, prophetic portions of the Bible mean? And you'll never understand what prophetic portions of the Bible mean unless you study the Old Testament. It's impossible. The, The Old Testament is where the origin of the prophecy comes and the context of where that prophecy is found in the Old Testament prophet is all important. Number two is that when you look at entertaining its New Testament fulfillment, the context, the chapter, the chapter that's before it, the chapter that's after it, the chapter itself, the context determines everything regarding its meaning and its interpretation. That law of biblical understanding prevents us from all, you know, 3,000 people from making up a cult individually. There's rules to studying the Bible. And uh, they're not hard, logical, reasonable, and certainly intentional by God. But one of the things that you need to mark down in the start of this whole thing is this, that the first coming of Jesus Christ... It's a very important event, you know. He's, he came. But where would you place his coming? If you're a student of the Bible, it is not his birth in Bethlehem. You might, with good intention, say, his birthday, Christmas. <laughs> nope, you're wrong. Oh, maybe it's when he raised the first person from the dead. Nope. His first coming is to the nation of Israel, and to the city of Jerusalem. And he has to come in his first coming as king. Second coming. There's a first coming, there's a second coming. And the second coming tells us that it's the same one who came at the first coming. That's where you start. Number two, he comes to the nation of Israel. No such nation until May 14th, 1948, a second time. He must come to the city of Jerusalem. He must come as king. According to the Bible, in the Old Testament, the first coming, he must ride upon a donkey. Isn't that interesting? A donkey. The second coming, no donkey for you. The second coming, he rides on a great white steed. A great great uh, horse of victory as conquering king. On, it's, it's, it's when he's riding the great horse in the second coming, Revelation 19, where his thigh is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Listen, at Jesus' first coming, there is no such label on his humble robe. He came riding on a donkey. And in Israel and in the Middle East, a donkey represents a king coming into an environment whereby he's bringing peace, not war. Jesus' first coming brought peace. And he brings peace today, my friends, by the way. Jesus' second coming. Well, that's a whole different story. The Bible says that his second coming, he brings war. The Bible says that out of his mouth will go a sharp two-edged sword, and with it he will strike the nations in his wrath and fury. He will judge the unbelieving world. And the Bible says that he will destroy the Antichrist and the false prophet. And he will, he will reclaim, or claim, I should say. The Bible says he must sit upon the throne of David. That's in Jerusalem, church. He's never done that. If the second coming of Christ doesn't put our Jesus on the throne, then we got the wrong one. That's how serious this is. Christ must come back to Israel. He must come back to Jerusalem. And he must sit upon an earthly throne in Jerusalem. The Bible says for 1,000 years. It's called the millennium. And I can't wait. It's going to be amazing. So we got the first coming and the second coming and between the two comings, when Christ comes to Israel in between, we've got this event, predominantly Gentile. It's not even a coming. It's an appearance, a parousia, 
where Christ appears in the atmosphere of John chapter 14, where he calls up from the earth. Imagine that. There's like a, imagine like a vacuum picking up his people. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, that we're going to meet the Lord in the air and so we'll ever, forever be with the Lord. And the Bible says that Jesus will take us to that place where he's been preparing for us. What amazing moment. But church, I'm going to run through these things. So we're going to go fast. Suddenly, we look at our first argument and suddenly life is interrupted. On that day in history, it's an amazing moment. But all that the Bible had said... We still know that in the crowd, there were those who were disrupted because they, frankly, they were not prepared. There's a sudden interruption to life. And you look at verses one to three, and what we want to do is make sure that we are prepared for the disruptions of life. Some were ready back then. Most were not. Biblically, they were supposed to be ready. Biblically, they had the book of Daniel. You know that now, right? Biblically, they had the book of Nehemiah. They should have been ready. Listen, um, I, I, I don't want to scare you, but I'd like to put you on notice because God puts me on notice every day. You've got this. Daniel's in here. Nehemiah's in here. Everything you and I need to know is in this book. You say, oh, I don't believe in the Bible. That's your problem. Here's the thing. God says that his word is without error, that his word is perfect, that his word is enduring. He says it will go out and will accomplish exactly what he sent it out for. And he makes the announcement that every word of this book will be fulfilled. Jesus said, when he returns, not one promise of this book will pass away, but that all shall be fulfilled. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but this word will never pass away. That's a remarkable statement. Do you know the Bible that like that? Do you have that confidence in the Bible? Because if today, imagine today, 2,000 years ago, they're believers. There's people that are recreational on it. They're not exactly sure yet. And there are those that are just flat out non-believers. I am not going to believe. I refuse to believe. And I just want to submit this. It's not for a lack of evidence. The reason why you're not a follower of Jesus, frankly, is because you choose not to be. You don't want to follow him. Just say so. I don't want anything to do with him. I denounce him. He's not going to be telling me what to do. And uh, I don't know about you, but that's exactly how he lived until I was 19. Until he got a hold of me. And then I thought it'd be great to change my mind. Uh, because I, I didn't know anything and he knew everything. Life's interrupted. Life is that way, church. To deny that is to not be prepared. Because dis disruptions will come. Now in all honesty, when it says there in verse 1, now when they drew near uh, to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, two sweet little villages, hamlets uh, on the slopes of Mount Olivet or the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples and he said to them, this is awesome. He said to them, go into the village opposite you and as soon as you, uh, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a cold tide on which no one has sat. Okay, loose it and bring it here. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. Now, what's interesting, remember the gospels, the quadraphonic or four different views from the authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. One of the gospels tells us that it's a, it's a little cult and it's mom. You say, oh, there's a contradiction in the Bible. No, remember the overlay? We know for sure this one thing, there was a cult. And then we keep reading, and then we find out that the colt had a mom, whatever a mommy donkey is, Mrs. Donkey. <laughs> and, and the Bible says that the colt and the mom went with, Jesus, went with the disciples, followed along. And I think that's significant, because the Bible tells us that there's going to be this little donkey, and no one has ever sat on it. Now, I avoid horses and donkeys as as. I just, no problem. I'm, I don't fear them uh, because I don't ever plan on encountering them. Uh, so I don't lay awake at night worrying about it. I just don't go near them. I, two things, they're, more, they're stronger than I am and they're smarter than I am. And that's, I, I want to avoid that. But chances are, if you sit on a baby donkey that's never been sat on before, what do you think is going to happen? I think you're going you're gonna to fall. You're going to get booted off. And um, it's interesting to me that Jesus we'll read shortly, was, he sat upon that little donkey. 
And apparently that little donkey didn't do anything. I wonder if that little donkey went, hmm. <laughs> my maker. I don't know, I'm making it up for kids. But it makes sense to me. But suddenly, you know, as this begins to happen, now you've got this disruption that turns out to be a great blessing. Maybe you have a disruption in your life that turns out to be a great blessing. Uh, I believe this. Don't, if you disagree, don't tell me because I, I really do believe this. All the stuff, for example, in this state, in, in our lives, the disruptions we're going through, I am determined based upon God's word that he's going to do something about it. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. Will he use this as an instrument to bring about good things? Or he will, will, or am I, are we willing to let him use us as instruments to announce judgment? I don't care which one it is, as long as you and I are obedient to what he's called us to do. We are to obey. He's the one that does the doing. Are you with me? We are to follow him. And he didn't ask us when and where. But there's disruptions, and I love this. So Jesus tells the disciples, we don't know. We, we assume from other scriptures that there's two disciples that go. Uh, we don't know their names. It's not mentioned. Um, now look, scholars on one side of the fence, church family, you should know this. Scholars on one side of the fence, great scholars, they say Jesus clearly prearranged this earlier in the week to then tell his disciples, go into the village, you'll find a donkey tied up and if the owner asks you what are you doing tell him the master has need of it the lord has need of it good scholars teach that i don't believe that <laughs> on the other side are really good scholars who say what's it for god to give the guy a dream the night before the donkey owner uber donkey lift donkey <laughs> whoever the guy is that the guy has a dream. Hey, you're going to meet two guys tomorrow. They're going to ask for your donkey. They're going to say the Lord has need of it. What's wrong with that? I like that one better. I don't see Jesus ever sneaking around making deals on the side, getting things ready. Hey, I'm going to do a miracle next week. Can you get extra fish and bread? I don't think so. This is not staged. It's not a stunt. Supernatural. And I love this. Maybe I'm making too big of a deal, but man, I see this happening. I could, I could, I just see this. And now, are you guys listening? Because what I'm about to tell you right now is not in the Bible. Are you with me? If I were writing this, I would think if it's two of them, I would have James and John do this. I wouldn't have Andrew. Andrew was kind of like a, a nerd, <laughs> right? And the, one, the other James, he would have just killed people. He was the zealot. He had a knife. He was like, say, calm down. What if the guy says no? James will kill him. It's not good. Peter's too big. He'd be recognized. He just stands out in a crowd. But do you know who'd get the job done? James and John. They're brothers. And uh, now this part's from the Bible. You know what their nickname was? Before they came to Christ, the village in Galilee knew them as those two boys, the sons of thunder. You know what that means, right? Because we got this idea that the apostles, see, we go to a museum, and the apostles are painted in oil paints, right? And they're walking like this. <laughs> and right here, there's an aura. And their robes most often fade into the landscape like they don't have feet. No, they're normal people just like you and I. But James and John, these are the guys that when ministry was getting weird and people were like preaching stuff and copying Jesus, these guys said, Jesus, you want us to call fire down from heaven and burn those dudes? <laughs> just say the word. James and John tatted down to the wrist. The sons of thunder, how do you think they got that name? Black robes. Everybody else had tan robes. They got black leather robes. <laughs> and they go there. And they get the donkey. There's a donkey tied up right there. They go into town. There's a donkey. They're untying the donkey. And the, the owner of the donkey says, what are you doing? Untying the donkey. And I wonder if James says, uh, you want me to, do you want me to say it or do you want to say it? Want to flip a coin? Uh, let's just, the master has need of it. <laughs> That's how they talked. 
the master's going to the master needs it. And the Bible says, the guy says, Let, oh, fantastic. And they bring him to Jesus. And something, they have no idea that something is unfolding that was written down nearly 700 years before Jesus was ever born, before any of them were born, that they're about to play front row seat to the unfolding of Daniel's prophecy that the Messiah, the Prince, would be entering into Jerusalem. It is the 177,380 170, days. Did, did they know it? I don't think so. Did they remember? I don't know. But it was there in scripture for them to know. And then secondly, I see that they're ready for what I would call a break-in. Look at verses 4 and 5, so to speak. The break-ins of life. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street. And they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing? Loosening the colt. And what I love about this is that it reminds me that God is working in your life. And though somebody thought, What are you, stealing my donkey? To get in the code word to understand it's okay... To the fact that in our lives, there are things that break in upon you and I all the time. There's not only disruptions, there's break-ins into our lives that cause us to be challenged. Our peace is shaken. Somebody says something, and it rocks your world. Listen, people, we need to get a grip. We need to understand, this is not the first time that we are going to encounter a break-in in in our lives. And I'm not talking physical break-ins, although it is sad. I told Lisa the other day, I said, oh my goodness, look, we're at Costco. Did you know what Costco's now selling? They've never sold it before. Pepper spray. That's how bad crime is in America. When Costco now carries pepper spray in bulk. (laughs) I'm not talking about physical break-ins. But I'm talking about break-ins upon your peace, break-ins upon your heart and your soul, break-ins upon your faith. And uh, we're going to have break-ins in our lives, church. Listen up. We don't have the time, but I could parade staff members up here who could exhort you to say, to, uh, to, th- uh, to think, stay in the Bible. If, I mean, I mean it. You, you guys, I don't know if you know or you don't know, but let me tell you, we know it in bulk. You may know it in a small scale. We know it in bulk because we deal with thousands of lives, and here's the deal. I'm leaving my wife. I'm leaving my husband. My kids drive me nuts. I'm out of here. I'm, I'm, I'm ending this. I don't believe in Jesus anymore. All this stuff is going on right now like never before I've ever seen in life. You know why? There's break-ins happening in your thinking and in your soul, and your foundation has been shook. Because things aren't going the way that you thought. Do you understand that if your wife gets her eyes off of Jesus and winds up walking out on you and the kids, that that doesn't mean you're supposed to do it too? Am I speaking to one person in here today? Well, she cheated on me, so I'm going to cheat on her. Excuse me, wake up. You're cheating on him. You're cheating. Listen, don't do that. Break-ins will come against your life. And we need to man up and woman up and know this, that God's got this. Did my heart get broken? Yes. Is this going to destroy our family? No, it doesn't have to destroy your family. Somebody who's an adult needs to stand up and hang on to the Bible. And if it's happening to you, take charge in God's word. This is not the last breakup that's going to happen to your life. We got troubles in this world. That's why heaven's going to be awesome. Number three in this argument is that we need to be aware of uncertain, the uncertainty of life. This is kind of a funny statement, is it not? Uh, To be aware of uncertainty of life. Say, wait a minute, if I'm aware of the uncertainties of life, then nothing's uncertain. You got it. Because doesn't that sound a little weird? You need to be aware of the uncertainties of life. Number one, you have to admit it. There's uncertainty in life. Some people have a hard time with this. Are you a control freak? This is a hard one for you. Because it's like, everything, this, that, set, everything's fine. 
poor things. That's a rough life to live. Everything is just perfect. And if something's out, it's just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and then you feel better. Right? And then the dog runs through chasing the cat and everything's gone nuts, right? But what I say about being aware of the uncertainties is to know that whatever you set up, life is designed in such a way, everything, everything in life that is ordered falls apart. You know that? I hate to, I hate to bum you out, but it's called the second law of thermodynamics. It's called entropy. And whatever you put together, the moment you put it together, did you know that micro, electron microscope wise, if you could watch it, as soon as you screw the nut down on the bolt, guess what happens? You can't see it and you can't even hear it. As soon as you tighten it and walk away, the nut starts to undo. Did you know that? Say, so, well, then why tighten the nut? <laughs> Only for this reason, to keep the squeaks from happening, to hold it together as long as you need it. Everything's coming apart. It's the law of science. You don't need to worry about it. Yes, it's true. The oceans are going to rise a half an inch in the next 10,000 years. And you want to sit around and worry about that one? Knock yourself out. The uncertainties. The Bible there tells us in verse 6 that they spoke to them and just as Jesus had commanded, so they let them go. I love the fact that Jesus is in control. It's a rough road when we decide to be in control. It's best just let him have it. Listen, it's a sin. Did you know this? It's a sin to worry. It's a sin. Why? Because when we worry, we're telling God he doesn't know what he's doing. He can't handle this. Oh, yes, he's going to take me to heaven, wash away my sins, and I'm going to yeah, make it into the glorious land. But, oh, man, my mortgage is coming up. <laughs> if we, <laughs> listen... You can trust him with all that little stuff. Yes, you See, pastor, but I'm sick. I got a lump. Or pastor, I'm sick. I've got cancer. Or pastor, I've got a blood disorder. He knows. Yes. He knows. But this is what's going on. He knows. He knows. God is much more committed to getting us to know his faithfulness than for us to have our desires met. He's trying to establish faith in us. Point number two is in verses seven to 10. Suddenly, life will demand a decision. This is true about life. It will demand a decision always. And I might add that decisions always have, oh boy, listen, decisions have ramifications. Wake up your woke friend that you brought here today or your teenager. Here's the deal. Decisions you're responsible for. Just that right there ought to get me... Muted off of YouTube. The decisions you make, you're responsible for. I've used this. There's all kinds. You can't see this because these guys are cool. But there's all kinds of electronic stuff up here. Wires and there's things that look like they would shock me. <laughs> if I picked up some of this stuff and just stuck it in my mouth. Hmm, what's this? <laughs> and... Who, would, who do I file a complaint with? I was in Russia years ago. We were doing mission church plants and big snowy day and there's this big black hole in the middle of the street. Everything's covered in snow and I'm walking with my translator Oleg, young kid, 19, about 19 years old. We're walking along and there's a big open hole that leads straight down to some sewer pit somewhere. And I said, man, that's crazy. If that was in America, somebody, if they fell in that, they'd own the city. And I just kept walking. And Oleg, every time you said something that he didn't understand, he'd pull out his little paper, his little, his little uh, thing, booklet, and he'd write it down. So at the end of the day, he said, uh, Pastor Jock, I want to ask you something. This, uh, you say that uh, the man walking down the street in the... He falls in the hole. He falls in the hole and he, he owns the city. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, I, I don't understand this. And I said, in America, we sue everything that moves. 
And if it doesn't move, we sue it anyway. So somebody, there was no lights, there was no barricade in the middle of the street. The manhole cover was off. It's a liability. The city's responsible. The man falls in there. He scratches his toe and he, he's, he gets a billion dollars. It's America. And he said, not in Russia. In Russia, you fall into a hole all by yourself. He said, the city would probably sue you for falling in the hole. He said, nobody's supposed to fall in holes. You're supposed to watch out for that. Who's right? He's right. We've become so convoluted. Well, I made the decision, but I'm not responsible. Yes, you are. And regarding the gospel, nobody else is responsible for your decision but you. Think of it. He's writing, Jesus is coming, fulfilling scripture. Zechariah 9, 9 says the Messiah will come riding on a unridden baby donkey. Watch for him. Daniel says, you know the day, April 6th, 32 AD. They should have gotten up that morning and said, kids, brush your teeth, put your sandals on, pack your lunch. We're going to the Mount of Olives. Today is going to rock. Today is what Daniel talked about. Get your camera. Let's get going. Let's do this. It's going to be amazing. Some did it. Most didn't. But watch out for what I call the, the mob rule. Where people today will, just because they don't believe, they'll make fun, ridicule, scorn you for believing. I want, you, I want to encourage you again. Your faith is founded upon fact, Christian. And so they brought Jesus and they threw their clothes on the donkey and he sat on it. No problem. No bucking, no war, no nothing. He sits on it. And many spread their clothes on the road and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Verse nine, then those who went before and those who followed. Wow, that's surround sound. People in front of Jesus and people behind Jesus cried out. The word cried out is they loud. And if you've ever been to Jerusalem, think about where we're at. You, you see it in your mind. This Palm Sunday path, in fact, it's called the Palm Sunday path. It's, sometimes it's broad, broad. When I say broad, sometimes you could drive a truck on it, and sometimes it gets narrow towards two people wide. But listen, we know that that trail has been in existence for 1,500 years. So there's a high probability, because of the way the Mount of Olives is laid out, that that path has been there for thousands of years. It's very high probability that Jesus went on that path. As he's coming down the Mount of Olives, heading toward the Kidron Valley, Flavius Josephus makes reference to the fact that there's somewhere around 100,000 people that are lining that hillside. And the people begin to cry out. And look what it is they cry out. Look at verses 9 to 10, which warns us about opinions. The people began to say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Church, what I want to point out to you is, listen, people will have their opinions. People will have their views on things. I want you to be aware of the fact that your Bible, you can stand on this book. When the, look right here. When it says here 2,000 years ago, Hosanna, that's an Old Testament moment. When it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, that's an Old Testament passage. Do you know how I'm always saying to you, read your Old Testament? This is the reason why. Recorded here in the new is the quotation of the old. They, they give reference to David. That's the Old Testament. And they say, Hosanna in the highest. That's the Old Testament. The word Hosanna means save now. More technically, it is salvation now. So listen. Those of you who are here and you're not too sure about all this. You've got a real event that's recorded by the Roman Empire, by unbelievers. It's in the Bible. And it's corroborated by those who are eyewitness accounts, including eyewitnesses who did not believe. There's documents that refute that what happened on this day was a mistake. Israel's prone to finding messiahs and saviors. And it just happened to have been on that day. Oh, and Jesus... And Jesus he was beaten severely, no doubt about it. Everybody witnessed that. But when they buried him, he was in a coma. And the cold tomb revived him. And on the third day, he was able to get out. People believe this. Listen, he did not revive. 
He died. He didn't need any help to get out. He left that setting all by himself. And everything that he did was based upon pre-written scripture in the Old Testament that God wrote history down in advance. And you need to examine that and make a determination because friends, you may not like me or the person sitting next to you, but what I'm telling you is pure truth. And you better find out if it's false or not. And by the way, when you find something false, write a book. You'll be famous. You'll be the first one to ever find a boo-boo in the Bible. And you'll make millions. So watch out for mob rule and watch out for the opinions of others. These people were shouting, Hosanna. But how many of those people later in the week wound up saying crucify him? We don't know. But there's a danger of a mixed multitude. But we're all faced with decisions all the time. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 21, verse 4, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the prophet saying, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. What do you think the mathematical odds of that is to have that happen on this day in history? And then they shout the Hosannas. That's from Psalm 118. You guys, every Jew, remember, let's go back in time. We got sandals on. We're with them. The Jews who were there, watch how they reacted. The Jews who were there said things like, who is this? Or, this is the Messiah. Let's shout Psalm 118. Hosanna, son of David, save us. Or, you're in a group that says, I don't believe this. By the way, when you read the Bible carefully, those who are eyewitnesses accounts to the events who claimed, I don't believe this, it just so happens they were written in the scripture, and there may be others, but they were professional religionists. It would be like people today saying that they've gone to church all my life, but they don't believe. I've gone to church all my life, but I don't believe Jesus is the son of God. Well, what a waste of time. You could have gone surfing or coloring or something. <laughs> wow. No, those who were there, I submit to you, they understood what was going on enough to address it to Scripture. They assigned it to Scripture. Don't you find that kind of peculiar? Pretty amazing. Matthew chapter 21, verse 10 says, And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, who is this? The word moved right here is simply this, that, they, that there was a, a tremor in their emotions. They were moved to uh, the depth of their soul. They were troubled. Who is this? You know what it means? It means they were forced to think. You can't make anyone think. Don't you wish you could? How many of you homeschool your kids? Raise your hands. How many of your school teachers? Raise your hands. Listen, Professors, school teachers, college, don't you wish you could force your kids to listen and to learn? Wouldn't it be neat to throw a switch and they just learn? Oh, that was it. Awesome. Have a good day. Just download it on them. And they got it. Probably shouldn't say that too loud. They're probably going to invent something like that. But... They're asking the question, who is this? Because we've been shaken to our middle core and we're troubled over this moment. That's a good thing, church. And then thirdly, finally, it's right here, verse 11. Suddenly, life will happen to you. It's gonna happen. Life's gonna happen. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. Now, I must be uh, exact here. He didn't go into the temple. He didn't go into the holy place and then the holy of holies where the priest would go. He didn't go in there. And I'm so glad he didn't go in there because for him to go in there, he would have honored the spot. And there was no reason for him to honor that spot. You want to know why? Because there's no lamb's blood that is going to go in there. And it certainly is not going to be his blood going in there. Aren't you glad? Your salvation is secure in heaven above where Jesus said, moth and rust and thieves cannot break in and steal. That's where my salvation is. Okay, you, you might get robbed but that's all they can take is your junk, is your stuff. Nobody can take your salvation. Right? The whole, the whole globe could burn down and nobody can take your salvation. Aren't you glad? Because in 70 AD, 
The fifth Roman legion led by Titus Vespasian came in to put down an uprising in Rome and the temple caught fire. The tapestries on the inside caught fire and burned all the gold on the inside. And the emperor of the Rome ordered Titus to remove all the stones one upon another and scrape the gold off that melted in between the cracks. And Jesus said that, listen, Jesus said, I tell you this, this temple that you see, every stone's going to be taken down. Not one stone will be left upon another. And now the people must have thought, what a ridiculous thing to say. This is God's house. He's not going to let that happen. Guess what happened? In 70 AD, it came down. 70 AD, hallelujah. Because Jesus had been in heaven a long time before that. Your salvation had been purchased. And he went before the very altar of God in heaven above based upon the book of Hebrews and offered your salvation in a place that it cannot be stolen, played with, manipulated, or wrought away. It's eternal. Life, listen, suddenly life will happen to you. But where will you be in the crowd when it happens? What opinion, what view, what faith will you have? Is Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God? And so we need to reflect upon what I just simply called God moments of our lives. Can you stop for a moment and think? It says in verse 11 that Jesus went into the temple, into Jerusalem and into the temple. So he walks the court of the women and the court of the Gentiles and he walks through there. And apparently what's implied is that it doesn't say a word. He just walks and he looks. He surveys everything. Man, I don't know about you, but the more I meditate on that, it creeps me out. I'll tell you why. This is God looking. This is God watching. This is God taking an estimation. He's taking an evaluation of what's, what's happening. You know, just moments before that, in Luke chapter 19, verse 38, we're almost done, don't worry. In Luke 19, 38... It says, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The people were shouting peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And here you go. Verse 39. And some of the Pharisees called to Jesus from the crowd. These guys. They're, all, they're everywhere Jesus is, but never once for three and a half years would they believe a thing he said or did. And everything, every time he did something, they attacked it. You know people like that? And it's horrific when it's these smug, pride-puffed-faced religionists. There's nothing worse. They're all dressed up. They got all their priestly robes on, their gowns. They all, you know, they're never alone because they can't think by themselves, this, these types. They've got to be in a little group, preferably five or more. And they hide behind each other's What's the word? Pontifications? Well, as I was pondering that, a thought appeared. And I'll share it with you. I believe. And it's like, really? And so this is what they say. Teacher! Right out of their mouth. They open their mouth and they lie. They, he's not their teacher. They won't listen to him. Teacher! Rebuke your disciples. Can you imagine? From the crowd. They're with the people. Can you? Jesus, please, please. Can you tell your disciples to shut up? <laughs> all, all this shouting of the Psalm 118 and people shouting Hosanna reminds us of the Bible. <laughs> and we'll have none of that here. This is the Holy Land. We tell people what to believe. We're losing our grip. So can you just tell them to zip it? And the Bible says, unfortunately, the Bible says this. You say, what? Yeah, I know. I'd like to have it written a certain way. Look at the screen. I'll read it the way I would like it to be. And then you can look at the truth on the wall, on the screen. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered and said to them, you zip it. <laughs> Open your eyes and watch what I'm about to do. I'm going to ask my disciples to all be quiet so you can hear the rocks cry out 
who I am. Now that's what I would have done. I think that would have been cool. God had a better plan. Jesus said, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would cry out. Underneath, 10 feet below my feet, 10 feet underneath this plaque I'm standing on are a bunch of rocks from Israel. You know why we put them there? Because that day we had that service on, a right here, on October 5th, 2002. We said here that if we ever cease to be a church of worship, that these stones would testify against us. May we never stop worshiping. And beneath the feet of every person that stands here are stones from Jerusalem to, re- to warn us that we better worship. But imagine, imagine in that moment, imagine in that moment if Jesus would have said, shh, everyone, listen, these guys are having a hard time with this stuff. It's too much reality for them. Certainly too much Bible. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to just be quiet for a moment and just give them a thrill. So imagine it all gets quiet and all of a sudden you hear, praise the Lord. (laughs) Guy picks up a rock. Then he picks up like a bigger rock. Hey, praise the Lord. (laughs) Some big boulder that some guy's leaning on. Praise the Lord. (laughs) The rocks would have cried out. I love that. Say, Jack, you're crazy. Oh, no, I'm just getting started. Because listen, when Jesus returns, the Bible says nature will worship him. Nature. Listen, the birds are going to sing, right? Nature, it's amazing. And it says... It says that when he restores the earth in his second coming, it says that when the wind blows, the trees of the fields will clap their hands. You say, wait a minute. Trees don't have hands. Yeah, it's a metaphor. When leaves slap, when you lay under a tree or walk under a tree when the wind's blowing, how do you know the wind's blowing? The leaves are hitting each other. The leaves are slapping against each other. And apparently when Christ comes back the second time, the trees are going to go right on. Yeah. About time. Woo. Here we go. It's going to be amazing. So church family, life happens. God's word has been given to you. So you do not need to know the things that The enemy wants you to know that it's dangerous out there. It is dangerous out there. That it's a crazy world. It is a crazy world. That there's this or that. There is this or that. But God. The enemy wants you to know all the things that can harm and hurt and get you to focus on that. And God speaks to us and says, I'm going to lead you up and beyond all of this. I'm going to take you through all of this. Nothing's going to happen to you unless it gets permission from me. Everything's father filtered. And I want you to remember, you live your life like that. None of you need to tiptoe out of here today. You walk out of here today knowing God knows every step of my life. I love him. I'm giving my life to him. I'm going to serve him. And he's responsible for my life. And God is good. Let's all stand together, church. Father, we praise you. We thank you, Lord God. All this week... May we be bold, lovingly bold, but bold. May we not cower or tiptoe around. Lord, may we look at people and, and, and speak to them when they're in line at the store. They're going to be buying. This is a big week for shopping. Stores are really counting on a lot of chocolate bunnies to fly off the shelves. Plastic colored eggs, candy of all kinds. Uh, and Lord, this is our opportunity. It's not about some rabbit. That's a pagan Babylonian cover-up for the resurrection. So Lord, give us boldness to say to people, hey, what's up with the bunnies? What's up with with the plastic eggs? Don't you know that Jesus has come and died and risen from the dead? Lord, may we be crazy bold. May we be reckless for you. We've been reckless for other things. May we be a fool for Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. We'll see you Wednesday night.